Today is going to be yeah, a little louder and <laughs> a little more luxury because I just have a lot of math to go through. Uh, so bear with me. But tomorrow we get to do the tutorial, which will be more interactive and doing some stuff yourselves. So um, we are going to talk about classic approaches. to the fixation probability. Estimating pi and or x, fixation or extinction. Uh, and the first one we've talked about quite a lot already is the branching process, right? And I think you know this because it again, came up all the time when I was teaching you the math, but I'll just give it to you in one place here so that it's all kind of solidified and always it's good to see things and then see things again and then see things again because it sticks with you. So the branching process, this is the Galton-Watson, the polymath, and the vicar, uh, and brought to population genetics by Haldane. In the late 1920s, uh, the pictures like this, individuals having more individuals, etc. And what we have to do to use this is define the offspring distribution. Offspring distribution, which you've seen many times now. So an individual has zero offspring or one or two with probability P0, P1, etc. And once you've defined that, then you just write the probability generating function and find its fixed point, and we're good. Um, but there's some hidden assumptions there, of course, so or not so hidden. So once you've defined this offspring dis distribution, we assume that every single individual in this lineage out to infinity has exactly that offspring distribution, right? Uh, and then by this we can just say f of x equals x. One of the most surprising and beautiful results in branching processes and useful. Okay, so can you tell me, Maybe I'll tell you the advantages and you can, while I'm listing the advantages, think of the disadvantages and then you can tell me the disadvantages. So I love branching processes because they're elegant. They're pretty straightforward to write. I would say it's intuitive. You can explain this in 30 seconds and that's basically that and that are your assumptions. You know exactly what's going on in your system. Um, they extend really nicely, as you've seen, to multiple types and also to continuous time. Uh, and you'll remember in the continuous time case, then we get these, uh, generically, we get a partial differential equation for the time evolution of the generating function, but you can derive those for, from first principles and you can derive them for really complicated stochastic processes pretty easily just from first principles like this. So that's another big advantage. That's why I've used them a lot. Okay, disadvantages. Tell me your least favorite thing about branching processes. What's a disadvantage? 
No mutation. Yeah, there's no, well, no, there can be mutations, as we'll see in the tutorial. Yeah, remember the multi-type? Yeah, you can put mutations in. Yep. That's correct. That's a huge assumption, right? So you can't have any limitation on the population. You can't have, really, you can't have the mutant lineage interact with itself in any way, so in a density dependent way. So any problems where you want the population size to change over time, this isn't going to work. So let's see. I guess I put here that assuming this kind of constant f of x for everyone or for all time is really the problem. And what we could change things in time because we could use a continuous time process. So it's not really the time that's the issue. I'm trying to like lead you. Yeah, the number of individuals is the issue, yeah. For all is restrictive, especially when, I'll call it the mutant, well, I guess we could just call it the lineage. So, for example, um, if you wanted to know the extinction probability of a lineage that started at 90% of the population, this wouldn't be a good approach, right? Because when it's 90% of the population, they're affecting each other. Uh, the population of the, uh, sorry, I'm not explaining it very clearly at all. Uh, let me go back to my notes. <laughs> Yeah, we want them to not have any effect on each other. And so they're really accurate when this mutant lineage is rare. Okay. And typically, the, we can't use the branching process uh, to model this large population. I'm regaining my uh, train of thought here because here's another way to think of it. This branching process, if it doesn't go extinct, what happens? Yeah, just it takes off to infinity, right? And real populations don't take off to infinity. So if you care about populations or a lineage that is getting close to the population size, you can't use a branching process to model it. Uh, so you'll see this as um, what people will write is that they've assumed that the wild type population is large. You're not really assuming that the wild type population is large, you're assuming that the individuals in your lineage have no effect on each other and have this constant distribution of offspring irrespective of how big the lineage gets. Um, not, you have to use a different formulation. It, yeah, yeah, we can't do it quite this way. No. Not if it depends, you can have it depend on the wild type population size, which it depends on time, and then go to this. But depending on its own state is really complicated. Yeah, it's because the mathematical formulation to write it this way, when you're here, you want, you don't know if you're here or you're here kind of thing. You want to have this guy kind of know the whole state of the population. 
before he makes his offspring choices, and this guy as well. And uh, yeah, the, we wouldn't be able to use the fixed point rule is the problem. And that is really what's saving our butts here. You could do that if you wanted to do an infinite composition, f of f of f of f, and then you could change f every time, right? f1 of f2 of f3 of f4, and then do the infinite composition, evaluate at zero, you could do it that way. But to use this, that beautiful result, you, everybody needs to have the same. Okay. Uh, so, despite this disadvantage, it's not as, it sounds like it's really like, if you wanna look at fixation, how can you use a branching process then, right? And I've said before, it's because we're really looking at extinction or non-extinction. But the thing that saves you is that when you're looking at beneficial mutations, if they're going to go extinct, they tend to go extinct really fast. So if they survive for 10 or 20 generations, they build up a little family around themselves and then they start to grow. They're not gonna go extinct anymore. So when the mutants go extinct, they go extinct very early in the lineage. And so branching processes usually This is basically true until extinction happens. And when it's not true, extinction isn't gonna happen, so it doesn't matter. So if you compare branching process results with like individual-based simulations, they are bang on. Like really, it's a really good approximation. So it's not as bad as it seems. Because extinction tends to happen very quickly, like 10 generations at most for realistic uh, S values. Okay, but in there I also mentioned beneficial mutations. That's the other main disadvantage. It's a hint towards the other main disadvantage of a branching process. So if you had a deleterious mutation, what's the extinction probability of the branching process? Yeah, it's one, right? Remember, if the, if the mean is less than one, then the slope, et cetera, we had all these little pictures, it's gonna go extinct with probability one. So we can never estimate extinction probabilities for deleterious or even neutral mutations with this approach. Okay, so that motivates us to move to the second main approach, which is a diffusion approximation. And we get to do way more fun math. Uh, right in the 1940s, Kimura in the 1960s developed these ideas. So the main thing here, we're counting individuals. One, two, three, 10 members in the lineage. And here, we're not gonna count individuals, we're gonna look at the frequency of the allele that we care about, okay? So that's the main conceptual difference. And we're gonna use P for that frequency. I guess we'll have P of T. Uh, so if you had a de novo mutation, as we've seen before, P equals one on N or maybe one on two N. If you're diploid. Okay, and so having said P, um, my population size is 10. What values can P take? Could be zero. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, it can't be 0.25, right? 
this is the main assumption that we're going to break for the diffusion approximation. We are going to let P be any real number. Okay. So mathematicians, usually it should be restricted to a subset of the rationals, but we're just going to let it be real. So uh, for it to be real, what has to be true about n for this approximation to be not too terrible? It has to be kind of big, right? Like if it were 10, it wouldn't be a good approximation. There's too many too much of the real line is missing between 0 and 0.1 and 0.2 and 0.3, but if it's 10,000, we're good. So there's an implicit assumption of a large population size here as well. Okay, and then the basic idea I'm going to sketch out for you here, this is time and this is P at some time zero. P of T is equal to P zero, P of T zero with probability one. But at some later time, T zero plus delta T, there might be a spread. We don't know exactly where this populate or where this frequency is going to go. So I'm going to do this properly. Let's first make the line t0 plus delta t, t0 plus 2 delta t. So now I'm going to draw out of the board, 3D blackboard. 3D blackboard, there's a distribution of possible p-values because this is still a stochastic process. So just like there's a random variable, we don't know if you're going to have 0, 1, 2 offspring. We don't know what p is going to change to be. But there could be a whole distribution of p-values. And there could be a whole distribution of p-values here. So out of the board is like a probability density function. So p could be like this. And then at later times, this shouldn't actually be bigger, just wider. Yeah, everyone okay with my 3D diagram there? So this is the kind of process we're going to track. We know what P is at a certain time, and then as time goes on, there's a spread of probabilities. And when we want to look at extinction, imagine that this axis is instead here. Then if you could figure out the area in this tail, that would be the probability that P's gone to zero or below at that time. Can't really go below. Uh, but this would be the probability of extinction by time T plus delta T. And then in this tail, this would be the extinction probability at the next little time step. So these little areas. zero plus delta t or plus two delta t, et cetera. Okay, so that's the approach that we're going to try to do. Figure out what's in these tails. Well, the y-axis is p. The mean of that distribution are these dots. Yeah, and I'm just, this line is just connecting the dots visually. Um, if I just drew this, that would be the mean of the distribution of P's at different times. And then I'm just trying to show you the distribution widening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But here, P is not the mean. I mean, this is the same axis, kind of, yeah. OK. So uh, I guess we already kind of know. We can predict very quickly advantages. We can now treat, as you will see, deleterious 
and neutral and beneficial uh, and we can treat late times what I will call late times en route to fixation so when P is very close to one you can still use a diffusion approximation to see the probability that total fixation occurs uh, the disadvantages, especially for people that don't have advanced mathematical training, you'll see the disadvantage right away because you have to do like a little bit of messy math. It's kind of just harder to explain to people. It's harder to do. Uh, it's more difficult, therefore, to extend to trickier cases. So when you have something that's nice and simple mathematically, then you can extend it to multi-types really easily. But something that's more complicated, it becomes even more complicated when we want to extend it, right? Uh, and it can't really model very large S, I'll say, or large negative, I, let's say large evolutionary forces is what the textbooks will tell you. Uh, for reasons that I think will also come up with as we go through the math, but you don't want the change in frequency to be too big in a one time step. Okay, you ready for the actual math? You wanna stretch? <laughs> Hopefully not yet. Okay, um, you should take take down the notation and refer back often to it. The notation is going to be a little bit of a barrier at some points. Okay, so diffusion approximation, here we go. It's actually, I mean, people always say this, it's not that bad once you get through it. Um, the, the concepts are not really hard at all. It's just the notation to do it carefully. You just have to have a certain amount of notation. So let's start with that. Psi of P and T is that distribution coming out of the board. That's our third dimension on the board. So let that be the probability density. of the allele frequency P at time T. Yeah. And then we're actually going to condition that given an initial point of the frequency that we know. So this is probability density of P at T given P equals P zero at, I'm gonna say time zero without loss of generality as mathematicians like to say. Yeah. It's like a trick to make things easier or? This? Yeah, conditioning on P. Um, I would say it's a notational trick. There always is going to be a P naught, and just putting it in there explicitly will help us keep track that everything depends on P naught. And later, the dependence on P naught is going to become absolutely critical. So it's nice to have it as a, like explicitly part of the definition. Yep. Yep. It's a good question. Okay. And then G. G depends on P, epsilon, semicolon, delta T. Maybe we can just make it a comma. Let's just make it a comma. This is the probability that P changes from P to P plus epsilon in time interval 
delta t. So that's our density function, the stuff that comes out of the board, distribution of what p could be. And this is p takes one little step. What is the probability? G gives us the probability that that step in delta t is of size epsilon, right? OK, so one little step, probability density. And then that allows us to write the equation that will make all the magic possible. So we write psi p t plus delta t given p zero. So that would be probability density of p at time t plus delta t, given that it started at p0. So one little time step later, can we write psi? And that will depend, of course, on what psi was. We're going to draw it like this. We have psi of T, T plus delta T times zero. Uh, and from P zero, we know that it's P zero here. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't plan to do this explanatory figure, which I am thinking on the fly would be super helpful, but only if I can get it right. <laughs> Let me put this up here first. It's going to depend on psi of pt. Yeah, p0 plus epsilon. OK, let me talk you through this. You would think that if we wanted to figure this out, we might consider a process that went from P0 to T, and then from T to T plus delta T. And instead, we break it up like this. So we have the probability that it started at P0 and made a change of epsilon in the first delta T. And then it jumped from P0 plus epsilon to P in time T. So then it went T time units later. We do that jump to get to P. Are you with me? Some of you are. So we're going to say this is the probability that we started at P0 and took a step of size epsilon from P0 to P0 plus epsilon in time delta t. And then after that, we went from P0 plus epsilon to P in t time units. And that will get us to P at t plus delta t starting from P0. And then the thing is, you could have a whole bunch of different epsilons. So you could go to that epsilon. And then all the rest of the way, or you could go a little bit higher or a little bit lower. So we need to try all the different possible epsilons that we could do, add them all up. Yeah, finish, okay. So that's the trick. So like whoever it was, right, I guess. And the, well, Fulker Planck, same trick. And Komolgorov, Komolgorov backward equation, same trick. To, to set up this and then see that we can write this expression as the, like the sum of those two steps, that's the whole trick. And once you've done that, the rest is just like following the math through. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I was wondering about how to address that last night, in fact. I think we should talk about that after. <laughs> um, you're right. I think that 
Our intuition is that G only applies to very tiny steps, and we're going to use that later, and psi is the whole, you could have a very long time. That's the, the easy answer. Yeah, then I think they'd be the same. Yeah, yeah it's a good insight. Okay, so we're, we're taking this, and then we're going to expand this piece. Psi of P T P zero plus epsilon. And I'm going to say that epsilon is small. That's why we called it epsilon. And I'm going to do a Taylor series expansion around P zero. So This is just linearizing, which Chris already talked about, right? If you imagine, you know, size a function of three variables, but let's say it's just a function of p0, and we know psi of p0, and we want to know, call that one p0, we want to know psi at p0 plus epsilon. We can look at the slope of psi here and kind of predict where it'll get to by p0 plus epsilon, so it's just a linearization. That's all we're going to do. So we say psi of p t p0 plus epsilon is this value plus the slope times the run, which would give us the rise. p t p0 plus the slope, di psi di p0 times the run. The run is epsilon, gives us the rise. And I'm going to add one more term in our Taylor series. This is just makes things slightly more accurate. Plus higher order terms that we're going to ignore because they would have epsilon cubed. And epsilon is already small, so epsilon squared is even smaller. So epsilon cubed is getting to be negligible. So those guys we're just going to ignore. Okay, so uh, the linearization I think is pretty straightforward, and then I just substitute that in. So this slightly messy piece is going in there. You maybe don't want to write this whole thing out, but I will do it for us. PT plus delta T given P0 integral. Let's put the G in front. P0 epsilon delta T, and then psi of P T P0, and here's our Taylor series, di psi di P0, di squared psi di P0 squared. Uh, D epsilon. Okay, um, and to save my arms and your hands, let's just use psi whenever it's just P, T, P0. We'll write it out if it's anything other than that. And let's just use G for G of P0 epsilon delta T. So for the like standard cases of these variables, we're going to just going to drop the other stuff. And then this is not a canonical case, so we need to write out PT plus delta T P0 equals, I'm going to split up those integrals, integral of G times psi. D epsilon plus integral of G epsilon di psi di P zero. Yeah. Okay, a lot of writing, but nothing conceptually is going on here. 
And then we notice happily psi, our canonical psi, there's no epsilon in there, no, deter no dependence on epsilon. So all the psi's can come out of these integrals. Okay, so then we get yuck. Still a lot of writing. P T plus delta T P zero is psi integral of G D E D epsilon rather. Uh, di psi di P zero integral of G times epsilon, and then a, sorry, di squared psi di p0 squared integral of G epsilon squared. Okay, we are almost there. Now we're going to simplify it even further. So the question is, what are these integral terms? So what is integral of g d epsilon is the integral of the probability that you were at p, mm, let's just write it out in words. g is the probability that you took a step of size epsilon. And if we integrate over all possible step sizes, what are we going to get? One. Excellent. Yeah, so that just goes away, which is really nice. Beautiful. And I'm glad that you also saw that. Okay. Since you got that one, g epsilon d epsilon integral of the probability that the step was epsilon weighted by epsilon or epsilon weighted by the probability that the step was epsilon. In words, what's that? Yeah, average step size, exactly. Really nice. Um, so this is the average step size or epsilon bar. And there's a notation we typically use for that. Um, so traditionally, we, the way that we define it is slightly different from that. You define M of P, big M, to be the expected change, like the expected step size really, but Expected change in allele frequency per unit, yeah, but per generation, which is our unit time here. Should have clarified that earlier. Uh, if it is currently P. So this is how much we expect the allo frequency to change if it's P right now. So for instance, if P is zero, M is gonna be zero. We expect no change. If P is one, M is gonna be one. And generically, how much change might depend on how big P is. And it's per generation or per unit time. But we want here, this is the average step size in how much time if you look back at G, the definition of G, that's in delta T, right? I'm pointing, but that might be gone now. <laughs> so this is per unit time. So we need MP times delta T. 
to give us the average step size in delta t. So MP times delta T equals average step size in delta T. Okay, and if you see that, then you probably right away also see what the third integral is. Uh, here, ah, uh, yes, there's a half missing, thank you. Let's put it here. Yep, thanks. Okay, so uh, similarly, integral of g epsilon squared d epsilon. That one gave us the mean and this one's going to give us the variance. So this is the variance of the change in frequency in time interval delta t. And we do the same kind of definition. We have v of p which is traditionally defined to be expected. Well, so variance variance in change in frequency. Well, in one time unit. So let's just put it right here, actually. So this would be V of P delta T. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're confusing me too. Why is that? We do define it as the variance not the second moment. I have to get back to you on that. Yeah, is it because the expected value of G is zero? Not always. That's a really good question. I have to think about it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I'm going to think about it. Sorry. Okay. Um, so substituting these guys in. We get this. P T plus delta T given P zero. The thing that we were after is pt given p0 because we were just left with a psi because that first integral was 1. And then we have m delta t di psi di p0 and 1 half, there's that half again, v delta t di squared psi p0 squared. And then you can see where this is going to. This guy is coming across. There's delta t's. So since we just did this like yesterday, I'm going to skip right. Di psi, di t. This would be di psi at t given p0. is m, I'll just put the p0 dependence back in there explicitly for now, di psi di p0 plus one half v and this guy 
is the Fokker-Planck equation, the backwards Kolmogorov equation, and it's what we need. Um, so we'll call it the Kolmogorov backwards equation. Okay, stretch. So this guy, I mean, it's a bunch of symbols on the board. What's it really telling us? It's telling us how those distributions that stuck out of the board, and we wanted to predict how they flattened out over time as time went along, it's telling us how they change in time. And it depends on how their, what their slope is with respect to P0, which we can't really visualize because it's a function of three variables, but, and that second slope, and what happens in a single step of one, well, the expect, expectation in one generation is what we've got it down to of change in frequency. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I think there's a lot of reasons why things work out really beautifully um, in probability spaces. There's a lot of things that we know that have to be true. Um, but I think that's also a question I should discuss with you offline. Okay, so how do we use this to get extinction probability? There's more. It was so fun already. On we go. Fixation or extinction. From the KBE. Okay, more notation. Define pi of P0. It's nice and easy to define. Probability of fixation, the fixation. Of our allele. Uh, given that it has initial frequency P0. So there it is in words and in symbols, pi of P0 is then the limit, T goes to infinity. If you remember the definition of psi, we need the probability P to go to one at time t, given that it started at p0. And then we're going to let t go to infinity, and this will give us the fixation probability. So all we're going to do is take this limit and apply it to every term in our KBE. So here, when we apply that limit to this term, we just get pi, right? And then over here, well, I'll show you. Uh, I'm lying. When we apply that limit to this term, I'm completely lying. What do we get? So this is this term is how our probability distribution is changing in time. So we have a probability distribution, it's changing in time. Can it keep changing forever? If you have a population size, you could say it keeps changing forever because it could cycle or something, or maybe we allow it to go to infinity. But a probability distribution. You're thinking, thinking. Yeah, so you're going to get some mass at one and some mass at zero. And once you get mass there, it can't stop anymore. And eventually you're going to get stuck. You get stuck. So as t goes to infinity, this change has to go to zero. I mean, we could prove that more uh, formally. But I think the intuitive argument is clear that as we take t to infinity, 
the probability distribution has to stop changing. It can't just keep changing forever. So our left-hand side goes to zero. No change with respect to t as t goes to infinity. Okay, and then on the right, here is where I misspoke. When we take that limit into this derivative, we can actually take it into the derivative and have the limit on psi, and this term will become a pi. Can you see that? So we have a limit around this whole side, the limit comes to this term and this term, and then the limit can go right through there, goes right through the derivative and sits there. This is the one little piece that depends on time. And when we put it there, this psi turns into a pi. So I'm not going to write all of that out. We get di pi of p0 di p0. Uh, and although that looks a little messy, we can easily solve that, right? So just to convince you, even any biologist who happened to have done one course in order, ordinary differential equations, you could do this. Uh, we're going to let y equal di psi p0 di p0. And then you get zero equals m y plus one half v y prime. Prime is the derivative. Uh, where, of course, m and v depend on p zero. We'll remind ourselves of that, but look how pretty this is, right? First order linear OD. You do an integrating factor, blah, blah, blah. So you would do your integrating factor e to the negative 2m over v. Dot, dot, dot is like exercise for the reader. And you get to, I guess, y equals some constant. But y is uh, di psi, right? So that gives us a pi. Pi of p0 is another integral, c. I just need to integrate one more time. Yeah, that's looking a little nasty, but that is the answer. Okay. Uh, again, from your first year ODE course, you've integrated, we end up with an arbitrary constant. We need some initial or boundary conditions here. Um, pi of one. Pi is the ultimate fixation probability given that you start at this frequency. You're already fixed. Pi of zero, zero. So you use those and then that gives you the C. And there's just enough room for the box. Here's our final answer. Yeah, and 
this is just the constant. Okay, processing, processing. This looks nasty. Um, let me give credit where credit is due. Chimera, 1962. This whole thing down here, that's just the constant. Well, it's one over the constant. This is the same result that we had over there. So uh, especially, well, we're gonna do an example, but let me talk you through it too, especially if you have biology training more than math training. Um, this is going to be 2m and v are going to be some functions of p. We're going to plug them in. We get some expression. We integrate it with respect to p. And then we have to integrate e to the minus of whatever we got there with respect to p again. And that'll give us something that's a function of p. And then we evaluate it at 0 in p0. And that'll give us a number. And then we just normalize it by this number. And that will give us the fixation probability, an actual number. And this normalizing just makes sure that our fixation probability, the number that we get out is always between zero and one. I mean, you can just see intuitively why this is, has to be the constant, because you need pi to be between zero and one always. Okay, so let's do just that. Um, because I think, it's much easier to understand if you've just kind of used it once. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to do a like. Nice, simple stochastic process from which we can figure out what M and V are and then plug it into that thing and see what we get. So the canonical example to use, which I'm going to use, is wright fischer So we have wright fischer sampling uh, in a haploid asexual Two alleles population size n uh, allele a. This is like the first thing you write down in your pop gen course, right? Allele a is at frequency p, and allele little a is at frequency one minus p. And big A has relative fitness one plus S, and little A has one. And we're also going to say that P is much less than one, and S is small. Okay, so I'm not going to derive M and P because I think you probably have seen this because this is so generic to like the first week of pop gen classes. If you have this situation in your first week of pop gen classes, you go through and figure out how many individuals there are and then you do like the binomial sampling of the population and figure out how you expect the frequency P to change and what its variance will be. And when you do that, you get What's the expected change in P in one generation of right fissure sampling? I mean, maybe you'll know. Anybody remember that? It's zero if P is one and zero if P is zero. And it's gonna kind of go up and over in the middle. 
Yeah, yep, exactly. There's a P times 1 minus P. And then we're looking at the beneficial allele. So there's also an S in there. And then the variance. In one generation, you do by binomial sampling. Um, and again, you might remember this one. We also get P1 minus P. And if you have a big population, there's very little variance. And if you have a small population, there's a lot of variance. Yeah, that's right. So these we assume we know, but that's just really by looking at right Fisher sampling from one generation to the next generation. We don't need to do anything in a continuous world with delta t's or whatever to get this. But starting with that, we can then plug those in to what we've just done and figure out the extinction probability. So now we get, therefore, 2m on v is 2sp1 minus p over p1 minus p, and we'll get an n up top again, 2sn. And then to plug in, we're going to need the integral of 2sn uh, dp. So with respect to P, this is a constant. So we integrate it, we get 2S and P. And then pi of P0, integral 0 to P0 of E to the negative 2S and P dP over the constant. And when we do that, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. No. Yeah. No, yeah, so this, if the definition of M and V was change in one whole generation, like in a world where there are discrete generations, and then we've used, we multiplied them by delta T to get very small changes when we did all this math. But the, in the end, what we need to plug in is the change in a single discrete generation. So M and V. No. No, um, not at t. I mean, it doesn't, these don't depend on t. They only depend on what your current frequency is. So they're functions of if the, it doesn't matter where we are in the times axis, if the allele frequency is now p, what do we expect it to be one generation later? So it doesn't, time won't matter to this at all. We could be at t approaches infinity, or we could be at T0. I understand, I understand that if you have a T, this is going to be the same. Yeah. Irrespective of what time they're looking at. But, but the, for the left hand side, they make the assumption that the change will be infinity and they're going to be one. Right yeah, so that, that was to find, that is true for the ultimate extinction probability. Right, we have to look for, at t equals infinity, has it gone extinct yet? And that will depend on how it changes all through time until then. And the way that it depends on how it changes all through time depends on these m and v's, all the way from when it starts at p0 until it goes extinct. So finding where it is 
at t equals infinity depends on all those previous times. And the way that it depends on those previous times is through these steps. But we're not saying that these steps happen at the very end time. They've happened all the way through. Maybe. Okay, so this guy you might have seen before. That's often given as the diffusion approximation fixation probability, right? And then it gets prettier and prettier. We can just make it simpler and simpler. So for a de novo mutation, if P0 is one on N, then we get pi of one on N is one minus E to the negative two S. So it gets simpler. Uh, and then we make it even simpler. If your population size is big enough, this term will be negligible. And we can get rid of the whole denominator, which is really nice. So if 2ns is much greater than 1, I'll just point out here that this is giving us, this is just as an aside. This is giving us the condition that S is greater than 1 over 2n. We keep getting this relation between S and 2n. It came up in Vaishali's lectures. It came up last time. Uh, then the denominator is going to 1. And then so pi of one on n in that case is approximately oh, one minus e to the two s. And then I'm going to simplify it even further. What if s is small? S much less than one. Uh, physicists. This becomes 1 minus 2s, right? It's approximately pi 1 over n, then is 1 minus 1 minus 2s. We get Haldane's approximation, which is really sweet, right? So the same approximation that we got for the branching process. Okay, and questions? Yeah, you guys are looking <laughs> shell shocked, yes. Yeah, so these are all if, so this is the equation we can always use. And then if various conditions hold, we can use these simpler, yeah, we can use simpler ones, we can use simpler ones, we can use simpler ones, and if all of it holds, we could get all the way to 2s, wherever 2s went. You just got erased. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. We could get all the way to 2s, which is really nice. But I think what another thing I want to say, though, um, which you've segued to, is notice that these conditions are in opposite directions. So we've got an s can't be less than a certain thing, and we've got s can't be bigger than a certain thing. And that you can see where that comes from. Let me sketch from last class. You can probably already see this before I get the sketch done, right? Do you know what I'm going to sketch here? We have this S and pi. So we can use this last approximation, when s is above a certain threshold, which happens to be 1 over 2n, but below another threshold much less than 1, let's say 0 0.1 or something, 
And that's where our fixation probability was really close to this 2S line, right? So we're getting the same kind of conditions out that we saw with the branching process approximation. So what happens here? If S, yeah, S is greater than, S is less than, we can't use this anymore because 2S will be less than the neutral expectation. And up here, you can see we, need, we start to need the denominator. If we don't divide by that denominator, our prediction for pi would just keep growing. So the denominator is bringing us back in asymptotically to 1. So if S gets too big, we have to keep the denominator. Right? So it all kind of fits together. Right. Yeah, so it's tricky. Um, we can do a little bit of that. Surprisingly, I have extra time now because I really, I just wanted to get to that point today and I thought it would take us more time. But because it, when, when it's not interactive, <laughs> it's much faster, which is bad. Um, so the question was this step that I glossed over and how different could these M and Vs be? I mean, I don't have an example close at hand, but the way we do that is these are the A's, and these are the little A's, and there's my population size, and then I'm going to sample into the next, but these guys have probability one plus S of being chosen, and these have probability one of being chosen. And then you figure out what's your expected value here, and what's the variance here. But you could make up, for instance, if you wanted to do a Moran model, you could have a different way of moving one time step, where I pick one guy randomly to die, and then replace that individual, with this type with probability one plus s and this type with probability one. And then I'd have a different expected change. My m would be different, my v would be different. Yeah. Yeah, so the results are the same when uh, n is very big. So yeah, this is condition one. I guess I should have, I apologize, Krishna, that I see this problem with my notes. If also. Um, so to get to the same approximation, we needed to assume that n was very big. So the branching process has no dependence on the wild type. So in fact, here's something that um, my students have knocked their heads against, and I did as well for a long time. Suppose you're simulating a branching process in an individual-based simulation. And we were doing a case where the mutant and the wild type, they grow together and then everybody faces a population bottleneck, and then it keeps going, there's a bottleneck, and so we did this as a trial run with this individual-based simulation to see what the fixation probability was. And say our population size is 100, and I wanna start with, what, I mean 100 is maybe too small to really even think about a branching process, let's say 1,000. One mutant, 999 wild types, and we start to write the code. And then at some point we realized we don't even need to include the 999 wild types in the individual based simulation because it's a branching process. The only thing that matters is the mutant lineage and it goes through the bottlenecks or not and it dies or not on its own. And these other 999 individuals, they don't change the results at all. So we can take them right out of the code. The code runs like a thousand times faster, literally, <laughs> and you get exactly the same results. Right? 
So the branching process, you just ignore. There's this infinity of wild type around which this mutant lineage is living its life. And we don't care. That's like the cloud is the environment. But if you need to care or you want to care about the population size, the wild type, then you need the diffusion approximation. For instance, if you care about a deleterious mutation. I, so, yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so you, you, yeah, you need to know what the mutant is relative to the, yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. Okay, more questions? Hmm. Shall I give you a break? I can, oh, I know what we can do. We can review, because reviewing is like the most important thing you can ever do if you want to learn something. We won't review today, though, because I had this idea of, um, I usually start my lectures with a little warm-up that reviews whatever we did last time, uh, so it warms people up and it reviews and brings everything back to mind. And I took it out of this class because I thought we're going to be too long. So we're not too long, so I have it right here. We'll put it back in. Here we go. So this will be a cool down. <laughs> so population size, a thousand. Uh, here's S. Give me your best guess or your intuition about the fixation probability for that S. Uh, work with a partner and compare. If you both have the same answers, you're probably right. Uh, so give it to me for, that's computational notation, 1 times 10 to the negative 4. Uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.5. Uh, I had a negative 0.1 in here. But I think you can't really intuit this very well. When it was a warm up, this was in here to show you that we didn't have any intuitions at all because we'd only done branching processes. We didn't even know how to treat this case. So we can kind of ignore this one now. OK, so go ahead and do your cool down. See if you can remember which formulas you might want to apply in which cases. You could even compare. Oh, this is an excellent cool down. So give me the right answer from Kimura's, because we can get a correct answer from this diffusion approximation. So you need a calculator for that one. It breaks down for s equals 0 because it tells us the fixation probability uh, due to selection. And there's also drift happening. And so we assume that the probability of fixation due to drift. Mm. I'm lying. It does, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you, yeah, Haldane's approximation breaks, you're talking about the diffusion yeah, approximation. Sorry. It's, yeah, it doesn't break down, I'm sorry, the Haldane's approximation breaks down. Yeah. But you're talking about the diffusion approximation, it doesn't break down. It's fine when s equals zero. We can, let's add s equals zero to the chart. Just in time, we add s equals zero to the chart. This is now part of the homework. So then you have to, L'Hopital's rule, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you, yeah, when the denominator and the numerator are zero, we have ways to figure out what it is nonetheless, and we do that, and it comes out to be one on n. Well, 
I was talking about Haldane there. I'm like a branching approximation. I was answering the wrong question because that one does break down. Mm -hmm. Selection and drift. Yeah, it has both in there because the variance is basically the drift, right? And we take the, the M is selection and the V is the drift. They're both packaged into the diffusion approximation. Right. So do we have some numbers here, I guess? For this teeny tiny guy, we should probably guess one on N. And does anyone have a real number? Very close to this. One, one. Yeah. Okay, and then for this intermediate kind of, we'd guess 2s, yeah. And excellent. And for point one, we guess point two, yeah. We're still in a nice 2s realm, maybe. And And point five, we no longer want to guess 2s, do we? <laughs> so we say it's like getting close to one, but less than one. We don't have a really good way to have an intuition here, except that it's going to be big. And how big did anyone get that far? 0.632, oh, not that big. And zero. That's a little tricky because then you know what to do though, right? At least the physicists and mathematicians know what to do here. L'Hopital, and then you should get one on N. Okay. Oh, oh should we do the negative one? Minus 0 0.01. Wow, <laughs> 10 to the minus 88, uh, yeah, at point 0.1, because that's a big negative, yeah. Okay, excellent. That gives you some intuition, too, about how these numbers go. So 2s can be 1, and you still have a 63, only a 63% chance of fixing. Okay, good. Thank you for your patience with a heavy lecture, and... I will see you tomorrow. Well, I'll see you. I won't see you at lunch though, right? I'll see you soon. <laughs>